Hello, I'm Andy Briggs and welcome to The Amazing Astronomical Alphabet, a weekly programme in which my Astro Radio co-presenter Daz and I will be talking about anything astronomy related which begins with the week's letter of the alphabet. We'll each choose some things to talk about which are in some way related to the universe, but neither of us will know what the other has chosen. We will then reveal facts about them which are weird, strange, bizarre or simply interesting. Well, welcome back listeners to the amazing Astronomical Alphabet with me, Andy and Daz. How's your week been, Daz? Uh, it's not been too bad. Um, it looks like the weather's on the improvement. I actually got to see the moon last night. Wow. Uh, so I managed to take some photographs using the new lens. But unfortunately, uh, with the way the moon is at the moment, it's very low in the, the sky, so I didn't get much but it's a nice little crescent oh, so lovely. until i get to uh, have a look at those i don't know what i'm but other than that it's been fine and yourself yeah fine um our weather's just about to break by the look of it we've got big black clouds rolling in at the moment so oh, i might, yeah. might have to rush out and get washing off the line <laughs> so <laughs> i'm just keeping an eye on it <laughs> Woman's <laughs> and also you can have a shower at the same time save on pennies well what are you, so. what, are you what are you trying to say <laughs> uh, I, I just <laughs> it's just that you're seem so lonely <laughs> <laughs> you're not receiving me in smell of vision are you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right well i won't take umbrage at that but i'll just get offended so uh, so there we are then all right uh listeners well uh welcome back we're on with the amazing astronomical alphabet and this week we have reached the dizzy heights of the letter f now, I think I'm right in saying, Daz, that like you, like me, you found it a, a little bit of a tricky one this week, yes? Um, exactly, yes. There don't seem to be many Fs about. You have to search high and low. and Because uh, the, the, the problem is, because we don't know which each other is choosing, um, we could end up duplicating uh, each other. But uh, we will see. Well, so far, I think we've only had two. That yes, maybe, we're uh, doing well. We haven't, uh, we haven't duplicated yeah. the other choices. I'm going to kick off today okay. with one that I'm pretty sure you'll have chosen because it was glaringly obvious to me and I didn't know whether to go for it or not. But anyway, here it is. F is for Fred Hoyle. No, I thought I would bet about him, but I thought, no, we've mentioned him before <laughs> and he'll have him. So we won on this one. Excellent. Okay. All right, then. Well, you know, I, I won't I won't go on about Fred Hoyle that much, but he does deserve a mention in astronomical history. Uh, Fred Hoyle was an irascible Yorkshireman uh, born in uh, uh, 1915, and he passed away in 2001. And Fred Hoyle is remembered mainly for two things, although he was, you know, an expert in all sorts of areas of astronomy and observations. He is mainly remembered for being the man who worked out nucleosynthesis in stars. Now, in case you're not familiar with what that term means, Fred Hoyle actually worked out how the nuclear reactions in the stars managed to synthesize the elements that they do, because all of the elements in the universe, apart from hydrogen, helium and lithium, basically, uh, originate in the hearts of stars. Now, there are lots and lots of complicated nuclear reactions that, that um, create these elements, everything heavier than hydrogen, helium and lithium, the so-called light elements. Everything else is created in the hearts of stars and eventually uh, blown through space by supernova explosions where massive stars come to the end of their, their lives. For one man to work all of that out, exactly how those elements are produced and what the nuclear reactions are, was a stunning achievement and one for which Fred Hoyle will, will always be remembered. But Fred Hoyle was also famous for being the leading light of steady state theory which was the uh, direct contrast to the Big Bang, whereas the Big Bang says that the universe had an origin in time and um, has been expanding ever since. The steady state theorists maintain that the universe has existed forever, will exist forever, and empty space is constantly being created out of nothing, uh, out of which we get the, the, the stars and the galaxies and, and, and everything else. 
Now, there, there was a lot of careful thought gone into the steady state theory. It's not like a modern day conspiracy theory where you don't need any facts, you just need a belief. Uh, the steady state theorists thought they had it all worked out until, well, there were lots and lots of pointers that the Big Bang actually happened, starting with the work of Hubble, uh, working on uh, the work of Henrietta Leavitt with variable stars and so on and so on. And in the late 1920s, early 30s, it became obvious that the universe is expanding, that distant galaxies are receding faster from us than, than, than nearby galaxies. And the key prediction of Big Bang theory was that if the Big Bang had happened, there would be a wave of radiation that traveled across the universe roughly 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And this was, if you like, the dying echo of the Big Bang. Now, this was a prediction of Big Bang theory, and it was found in 1964 by, the, uh, by two guys, actually, who were working for Bell Labs, the, the telecoms company in the United States at the time, who were doing early research into communications with communication satellites. And working on a big uh, horn antenna belonging to, to um, Bell Labs, they detected this wave of radiation that permeates the universe, which since the Big Bang has had its wavelength stretched to microwave wavelengths. And this was the long sought after cosmic microwave background that had been predicted by the Big Bang. This was indeed the last nail in the coffin of the steady state theory because the steady st state theorists had no explanation for this. It didn't figure at all in steady state theory. There was no way that it could have been due to the steady state theory. So this was seen as the last dying gasp of steady state theory that said that the universe had not had a beginning and will never have an end. Fred Hoyle, even to his dying day, refused to accept that the cosmic microwave background was evidence of the Big Bang and went to his grave, still espousing steady state theory. He never shifted from that position, not for a second. He was a stubborn, irascible Yorkshireman um, who, who held his ground, who didn't give in. And um, he is remembered for, for that, as well as being the man who basically told us how stars work. So there you are, Daz, that's, um, that's Fred Hoyle in a nutshell, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, as you said, he was a bit hard-headed. He was a straightforward speaker. Yes. Um, and it was due to this, um, as you said, because Fred Hoyle was one of the inspirations for um, Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Yes. Um, and it was one of his books that really steered her down the path that she took. Mm. Um, and when she was omitted from the uh, Nobel Prize, um, that he was very outspoken about it so much so he so criticized them that they think it actually um hindered his well it, it basically it ended his chances of winning a nobel prize himself because as you said when he was doing um the the uh, nuclear fission stuff mm. um he they actually there was a nobel prize awarded to the uh, for that but instead of uh, giving it to fred hoyle and his cohort, it was his cohort, William Fowler, who uh, yes, actually yes. received the Nobel Prize. He was um, omitted from it. So he sort of like, uh, his outspokenness sometimes did sort of like get him uh, into trouble, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. to say. Which is a um, great tragedy, because he should have got a Nobel Prize for that. He really should have done. Exactly, exactly. It's, because uh, because it's, imagine being the man who told humans how stars work. I mean, that's a hell of an mm. achievement. He worked more or less single-handed on that. And um, what a brilliant mind. And to miss out on that ultimate accolade, the, uh, the Nobel Prize for that incredible work is, is a real tragedy. But as you say, it was his nature. He was outspoken. He upset a lot of yeah. people. Um, he didn't listen to, uh, you know, opposing points of view. He dismissed, dismissed them. So, so there you are, but he should exactly, yeah. and will be forever remembered as the man who worked out how stars work in detail and told exactly. us exactly what goes on at the middle of stars that synthesizes the elements. And, yeah, uh, the stubborn and Yorkshireman told that. Stubborn Yorkshireman. Yep. 
So there you are. That, that's that's basically all I wanted to say about Fred Hogg, just a plea for us not to forget him, um, not to remember him as the as the opponent of Big Bang Theory, but we should remember him more for yeah. his work on nucleosynthesis. Because also he was he did work on um blue stragglers in uh, globular clusters. That's right. It was his it yeah, was his yeah. theories, right. it was his theories that um uh uh, how these uh, blue stragglers came about and how they actually work. Um, uh, it was his ideas that finally proved to be possibly right. So uh, that's right. Yes, blue stragglers, which uh, which should have been in the bees, really. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, we had lots to choose from in the bees, didn't we? Exactly. So, uh, <laughs> but that's for next time round. That's maybe. for next time round. When we get to Z, we've decided we're going <laughs> to start again with A. So, uh, so there yeah. we Also, of course, let's not forget that he was um, a science fiction author. <clears throat> and, oh, was he? I didn't know that one. Yes, indeed. He wrote uh, science fiction books on his own. I had one when I was young called Rocket Sinners and Major, which was a okay. fabulous read. And uh, I, wish, I wish I had that book. When I got into my late teens, in a stupid moment, I decided that I would, I'd had enough of all these sci-fi books on my bookshelves taking mm. up room, and I wanted to replace them with, with factual astronomy <laughs> books. And I gave all my science fiction, all science fiction paperbacks to a, to a charity shop, believe it or not. And I so regret that now. But, A, the folly of youth, what can I say? Um, exactly. He also wrote science fiction novels in conjunction with his brother, Jeffrey Hoyle. Uh, and you'll see several science fiction novels, Fred and Jeffrey Hoyle, and they're really good reads. I mean, they're dated now, obviously, because he yeah. was writing in the 1950s and early 60s, and uh, they are a bit dated, but, um, you know, still a very good writer, apart from anything else. So that's something oh, else we yeah, should I didn't know that. I didn't know he wrote yeah. science fiction. Yeah, he, he wrote, um, yeah. You, you can find a list of his books on the net easily enough. But, they, they, you know, yeah. from what I remember, you know, I haven't read them since I was a teenager, and, you know, you, you change as you get older. I'm, I'm yeah. currently reading another F, Daz, um, Asimov's Foundation, because all my life people have said to me, you've not read Foundation. You've not read the Foundation series. They're, they're, um, they're you know, they're, they're science fiction classics. Mm -hmm. And they've recently done uh, Foundation, the Foundation series on HBO. Uh, okay. Yeah. And I thought, well, I'd like to see that, but I think I'd like to read the books first. And I've started reading Foundation and I'm halfway through it. What a load of nonsense. It, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> honestly. No, I'm seriously. 2001 all over again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, Daz. I have never read a more tedious book in all my life. It is so boring. The reason it's so boring is that it's just talk between people. Nothing actually happens. It's all talk in offices. And I'm thinking, okay. and I just cannot get into this. I am gonna, I am gonna persevere. I am gonna finish it. I can't have people going on at me for half finishing Foundation, which I yeah. think is probably worse than not trying it. Um, but honestly, I'm finding it incredibly dull. So, um, so there oh, we okay, are. Okay, then. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll let you know how lucky. I get on. Yeah, because it's probably in the very last chapter that it all falls into place, uh, uh, like that film I keep on about Clara. Oh, uh, yeah, you've I'll got to watch it for the last for the last 30 seconds to, right. I'm going to make that my homework for this week Dad, yeah. I'm going to watch Clara yeah, exactly I mean it's okay. it, like I said you, you go along the science is great mm. um, a little bit of you know the gimmicky stuff and all that yeah. um, but uh, it's sort of like oh this is tedious this is tedious and then right at the end it's a <sighs> shocker you know so there yeah. you go yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sure that Foundation, Foundation Empire and all the rest of the novels, uh, I'm sure they're rightly regarded as classics. Foundation came out in 1951, so you have to put it in the context mm. of, of, and I'm sure it's a very different type of sci-fi from, from the rest of the post-war sci-fi, mm. which did concentrate probably on, you know, rockets and ray guns and aliens. And this was yeah. something a bit different. It was very political. There's a lot of politics in it. But reading it now, yeah. God is it dull. <laughs> so uh, I'm finding it difficult to stay awake, to be quite honest. I'm only reading uh, about two or three pages at a time before my mind starts wandering. So yeah. uh, and they're going to sleep. Anyway, so that's uh, that's Fred Hoyle. But F is for Frank Drake. Ah, no, now, I haven't got that one. Now, originally, this was going to be one of my D's. Right. Um, because we've, we, uh, I personally, in my shows, um, and on this show, we've mentioned him several times as regards yeah. 
uh, different things that he's done. Um, so I thought, well, basically, let's have a quick run through of um, his his life, a little bit of uh, find out the background of him, what he's actually did, and what other than SETI, what else has he done? Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, so S F is for Frank Drake. His um, uh, his, was... bro- his brother Charlie is probably more famous. Exactly. Yeah. Hello, my darling. Hello, my darling. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Half of people don't know what we're talking no, about. No, they, probably not. But they're probably the they're mad. <laughs> they're mad. They're mad. Mad. Um, yes. So F is for Frank Drake. He was born in 1930, um, and he is one of the principal founders of the Search for Extraterrestrial intelligence seti as we know it Mm -hmm. and i think most virtually everybody must have heard of that uh he is best known for devising the drake equation which you spoke about a couple of shows ago Mm -hmm. which can be used to estimate the number of intelligent civilizations in our galaxy not our solar system as i said no (laughs) Uh, because we know there's no intelligence no there's no intelligence whatsoever in this solar system um he is pass one on of aliens. Hand- pass on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, move on. Nothing to move see. Move on. Here. Nothing to see. Uh, <laughs> he is one of a handful of scientists who have devised equations that have uh, penetrated popular culture sufficiently to appear on T-shirts and other merchandise. Something else you mentioned. Yes, absolutely. Um, Drake has played a key role in composing messages sent out from Earth in the hope that one day an alien civilization alien civilization will discover and read them in addition to his seti work dretty uh, dretty and dretty uh, drake <laughs> was the first person to map the center of the milky way and he coined the word pulsar to describe rapidly rotating neutron stars now i've heard several I've stories, heard several about, stories about that as well yeah, yeah, I'm not, who, quite, who, not quite convinced about that who instigated the word pulsars mm. um frank donald drake was born in chicago uh illinois usa as i said on the 28th of may 1930 mm. uh, as a child frank's experiences of religion were rather negative his parents were baptists who lived rather austerely um laughter and joy were conspicuous by their absence at Sunday school, Frank decided that different religions had narrow beliefs shaped mainly on whichever part of the world they had begun in, and some of these beliefs had come about by chance. This led him, at age eight, to conjecture that human civilization was a result of chance, too. Elsewhere in the universe, he thought, other civilizations might be present. So at the age of eight, he was already thinking like a SETI person. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, becoming ever more interested in science, Frank began making frequent visits to, on his bike to Chicago's Museum of Science and Industry. He uh, came to know the museum's exhibits by heart, um, including one revealing that our sun is an average star among billions of others in the Milky Way. This made him wonder again if alien civiliz- civilizations could be here in our own galaxy. Right. Uh, Together with a friend, he started doing chemistry experiments and then they started building small motors. And later on, they like most teenagers, they started messing about with cars. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, at the age of 17, he won a Navy scholarship, which enabled him to go to Cornell University in Ichika, uh, New York. Um, Ichiku Park. Yeah. Uh, he intended yeah. uh, becoming an aerpl- airplane a- a designer but became more interested in electronics. Uh, He eventually majored in engineering physics, as we know. Yeah. Um, In his uh, sophomore year, he took a course in astronomy. Uh, He looked at Jupiter through a 15-inch telescope and was stunned by what he saw. The beautiful planet with its famous red spot orbited by four moons Galileo first saw about 337 years earlier. It was a life-changing moment for him. Um, and he, he then in 1951, at the age of 21, he attended lectures by visiting Professor Otto Struve. Um, in his final lecture, Struve talked about the, his recent discoveries that spectroscopy can be used to measure how quickly stars are spinning. Most stars spin more slowly than might be expected from theoretical cal- uh, calculations. Mm. Struve correctly deduced that stars are usually not alone, like our own solar system. Uh, 
uh, the central star is occupied, uh, accompanied, sorry, by orbiting planets. He concluded that life might very well be present elsewhere in the galaxy. So, thought Drake, here is a serious respected scientist talking about life on other planets. It was this, this first encouragement Drake received at a college to consider the possibility of extraterrestrial life. He went on to um, join, he, he carried on with the Navy to basically to pay them back for the fact that they had paid for him to go through college mm-hmm. uh, and things like that. And he was all, he actually was on the, um, on board the Albany, the sixth fleet's flagship. And he was responsible for all their um, electronics. Uh, he then moved on several times. Uh, uh, he, uh, where, where are we? I'm sort of lost my place. Um, but he, again, he went to Harvard University where, Basically, because he was an engineer, they wanted to use his skills and all that. So he basically worked most of his time repairing their old equipment and things like that. Um, uh, radio astronomers, um, he, 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 he basically was assigned to the radio astronomy unit. Um, and, and these are people who uh, analyze signals reaching Earth in the radio part of the electro, electro, electromagnetic uh, spectrum. Um, you can also use radar style techniques to study planets, sending out radio signals to rebound off a planet, returning the information uh, about the surface. And he used this with uh, Venus, and he actually uh, was one of the first people to map the surface of Venus. Mm. Um, so basically, as I said, he became um, part of the team there. He then moved to um, Green Bank. Um, and this is where um, Drake's first job after graduating from Harvard took him to the National Radio Astronomy Observatory at Green Bank, West Virginia. Mm-hmm. As a newly appointed member of staff, he was impressed by the Green Bank's 80-foot uh, radio telescope. Um, it was his first at- opportunity to work with equipment as sensitive enough to detect radio transmissions from extraterrestrials. Right. Um, uh, and it could detect uh, the uh, detect equivalent radio telescope at a distance of 12 light years, good enough to listen to transmissions from uh, about 30 star systems, including several stars similar to our sun. Um, in 1959, now this is where um, when we were talking about him before, in 1959, Drake secured an uh, agreement with other workers at Greenbank to begin a project he called Project Uzma. Ah, uh, yes, I remember Project Uzma. Yeah, yeah hunting yes. for ra- uh, aliens' radio transmissions. They agreed to keep the project secret for fear of being ridiculed, which is understandable. Understandable, yeah. Um, in September 1959, before Project Uzma had begun, uh, Giuseppe Cocconi and Philip Morrison, now these, these people pop up quite occasionally, actually, mm. published a paper in Nature entitled Searching for Interstellar Communications. The authors proposed that uh, that astronomers should carry out their search similar to Drake's project, Osma. This compelled Drake to go public with his planned work. Observations began on April the 8th, 1960. Mm-hmm. Now, it says here no aliens were detected. Uh, but a graduate student at Cornell by the name of, wait for it, Carl Sagan, contacted yeah. Drake. Never heard of which, him. To a lifelong call. <laughs> <laughs> that'll bring letters in which led to lifelong cooperation between the two astronomers um now when they turned on this uh, i think i mentioned this before uh, <clears throat> uh, drake's first achievements with the radio telescope at green bank was to map the center of the milky way galaxy uh, for the first time until then nobody had seen it because large amounts of dust and galactic at uh, the galactic center block visible light the dust are not block radio waves. So Drake was able to use the radio uh, frequencies arriving from the Milky Way center to map it. Um, He also discovered uh, uh, Jupiter's radiation belts. Did uh, he? Similar to to where Van Van Allen, I nearly said Van Halen then, (laughs) Van (laughs) Allen (laughs) belt. Um, Drake discovered the high temperatures on Venus do not change between day and night uh, and he deduced that Venus's atmosphere is about as thick as the ocean on Earth, trapping heat. Uh, He found the winds on Venus move at just a few miles an hour. 
he devised a method of an analyzing the polarization of radio waves to assess the geography, geography and mm. topography of the planet's surface. Uh, so again, as I said, that's how he mapped um, uh, his uh, that map the surface of mm. um, <clears throat> Venus. Right. Um, he, uh, what else did he do? Uh, do, 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 do. Well, they, uh, because of Project Usman, a lot of people got to hear about it and they decided to have um, a grand meeting of uh, great minds. And it was at this meeting that Drake, basically, he was responsible for putting out the format of this uh, meeting right and he realized um that he could actually express the topics that they were talking about um in one line of an equation um he's he realized that uh these that he, he could put a numerical number on a lot of the things that they were talking about and if you multiply these together um, into what has become the most famous equation in SETI which is the Drake equation which is Certain, you know, so um and that's how it all came about he found that he took each individual topic they were talking about he could assign a number to them or a value mm. and if he multiplied these together he should get a rough idea of how many planets in our own milky way yeah. i keep saying solar system again don't i you do in our own milky way <laughs> in our own milky way um that could actually possibly host um uh life so he says himself, I found I could reduce the whole agenda for the meeting to a single line, the Drake equation. Of course, I didn't have real values for most of the factors, but I did have a compelling equation that summarized the topics to be discussed. Sometimes people think the equation is highly speculative. Well, it is really. Yeah. In fact, it is just the opposite since, uh, well, he reckons, uh, since each phenomenon it assumes to take place in the universe is an event that has already taken place so it's basically based on things that we've seen before yeah that's true i guess yeah so um so um i'm just having a quick look through but i think uh, i think you know even if even with today's data and of course we do know a lot more about extrasolar planets than we did then but um i think the even the worst case scenario there are in our Milky Way galaxy uh, 20,000 planets where there could be advanced intelligent life. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I think that was the figure, 20,000. Um, if, you, if you go for a sort of middle case scenario, then you're up in the hundreds of thousands. And, um, you know, but it is still a bit speculative because there are plugins to that equation, parameters that we just don't know. This is the problem with the... Um the actual equation mm. is that the the numbers can be manipulated to give you such a varied result yeah um, which, which of course is it's not really then a scientific equation mm. is it mm. because no, it's yeah it's a guide more than anything i think yeah as it's, it's i like to say it's a guesstimation yeah, it's a guesstimation it's an equation that gives you a guesstimation uh, because if you take you know the most famous equation of all time uh einstein's e equals mc squared there's no messing with that. You, there's yeah. no room for. There's no wiggle room with that. It's. It is what it is. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> there's no messing with that one. There's no messing with not that. Not at the moment. Not no. at the moment. Not until no. someone comes up with something better. Uh, no, exactly. Um, yeah. But you know, e equals mc squared cannot be improved upon because it's the relationship between mass and and energy, and uh, that that goes without saying. That go, that's not up for question. It works. We know that because nuclear power stations work nuclear bombs work and uh, and the sun works and going back to fred hoyle you know it's all based on on atomic fusion which is you know yeah. dem demonstrated by e equals mc squared that if you take an amount of mass and convert it to energy then uh this is how much you get out and yeah uh this is why shows like star trek are complete pants because if you look at how the transporter room on the Enterprise works, it takes, uh, as I understand it, as, as has been written mm. in the Star Trek books, a couple of which I read when I was a teenager, that basically a human being is converted to energy, then reassembled at the destination out of what yeah. it never quite specifies. But, but yeah. uh, that's how it's meant to work. And that could never work simply because of e equals MC squared, because if you convert a human being to energy, the energy locked up in our cells 
if you release it as energy, you've got about three Hiroshima's. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, uh, the, the transporter room of the Enterprise might need a slight redecoration after that one. Just a tad, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, you know, yeah. so there is no messing with E equals MC squared. That, that, that's that's right. it. But the, so yeah, the, but the Drake equation is, is sort of yeah. like a, for a, a guesstimation. It's but let's, let's, not, let's not denigrate it. It's a, it's a no, wonderfully no. concise piece of work. Yeah. And, you know, as a guide to how many intelligent civilizations in our galaxy there might be, it's fun to play around with. And, yeah. um, and yeah. you know, and as I said, we know a lot more than we did when Drake wrote the equation. And, you know, exactly, yeah. it, it never comes to zero, even, even if you put the mm. worst case scenario and there are still thousands of potential planets out there with, with advanced civilizations on them. Yeah. But, but even if you take 20,000 over the size of the galaxy, that's, that's really not a lot, considering there are 200 odd billion stars in our galaxy uh, 20,000 yeah, exactly, yeah. of them might have um, planets with, with life around the yeah. intelligent well, life we'll talk about this a little bit later on um, okay let's leave that uh, for now then but, but also with uh, Mr Frank Drake he wasn't um, uh, his life hasn't been without controversy because uh, in 1974 he arrayed, arranged the Arecibo transmission Yes, that's um, the, the, the Arecibo about. dish had just been um, upgraded yeah and it, they had added a transmitter to it so it could actually transmit as well as receive radio waves it's definitely been so they sent now. out <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yes it's yeah. trash yeah, yeah. um and uh he sent it in 1974 and he pointed it towards m13 the globular, mm. the great globular cluster in hercules yeah uh, which is an, an, a, a a very good target anyway no, no. but it wasn't a, a serious let's contact et uh, experiment it was a case of that we can do it so let's do it yeah exactly let's have a go you um, know and also it'd, it'd be good you know it'd be good pr for or, um uh for uh, the arecibo yeah exactly uh, and uh, as barry norman would say but probably never did and why not so, yeah why not and um yeah. uh, basically if if, the, if if anyone does receive it in m13 it's going to be twenty thousand. it's twenty five thousand light years away so it's going to be a very long time <laughs> 50, before, 000 yeah. before we get a reply yeah the before reply we get will a be, reply you what yeah, yeah. What, what? <laughs> what, was what was that, that? sorry was that? we didn't get it <laughs> <laughs> what, what was 15 down yeah. um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, but of course as i said he was with uh, he was great friends with mr carl sagan and of course they devised um the plaques that went on um the voyagers and the pioneer uh, yes, probes indeed, been sent out indeed. into space and again the pioneer probes were full of uh, again caused controversy because yes. of the imagery on there yeah. um and uh so it, it, but what i will say is it, i was talking like i said i was earlier i was talking about project osman i think i mentioned this before that on april the 8th 1960 that was the first day they did their first listening mm. for extraterrestrial transmissions and they received a mess. Uh, they received a signal, and of course, they all got very excited about it. And on the first day, on the very first day, you know, <laughs> it happens all the time. And that doesn't didn't it? tell them there was something wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, but what they did is they pointed the signal away, um, and when they pointed it back, it was gone. Oh. Um, but. Um, basically they were still excited that they had received this uh what they thought could have been a signal from um an extraterrestrial race uh but frank drake wasn't convinced and in the end he said look he said what i think it is it's radar blocking um systems from the nearby air base oh yeah uh, probably. u.s uh, u.s yeah. air force uh, air base and all that and you probably found that basically they were monitoring et and they didn't want them so they did block it so you know you know you know what those americans like they mm -hmm. like to cover everything up. but of course as soon as that happened word had already um broken out um because people can't keep their uh mouths shut and uh the reporters were banging on the door and because drake denied it all the tin hat for a tin foil oh, brigade and they were around saying, even then yeah even then and they were saying that yeah. the first ever um signal received from um extraterrestrial life was being suppressed mm. um and of course ever since then we've had exactly the same problem um so that's just a brief run through um okay. frank drake's still alive as we said before yes, indeed and he he's still on the board of trustees of seti as well so he's still working yeah absolutely um 
so uh yeah he's uh that was uh, well, we've mentioned him lots of times and i thought basically we needed just to do a little bit more in depth oh sure, absolutely. Uh, absolutely about him and all that very so that was f for frank drake yeah. thank you thank you very interesting daz oh. i talked about fred hoyle yorkshire astronomer yep. called fred and i'd like to talk to you about another yorkshire astronomer called fred now and this is professor fred watson Born in 1944, he was born in Yorkshire, but he's lived most of his life in Australia. And he became um, the astronomer in, in charge of the Australian Astronomical Observatory in 1995. He's well known as a science personality in Australia. He does lots of uh, broadcasting on ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Network. He's known for his science outreach and uh, he's written many books. He, um, inter what I found interesting is again, if you want to go back to Herschel and many other examples, he's been heavily involved in music as well. He's a composer and oh, he, okay. writes, he writes choral works and he's a musician. Okay. Yeah. And I've always found this incredible that the, the number of people that are interested in astronomy who are also musicians and composers. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's exactly. some it sort of, uh, that, you know, I'd like to sort of investigate that a bit further. What is the link mm. between astronomy and music? Interesting. What if our listeners have got mm. any ideas? Are you an astronomer and are you a musician out there, listeners? I, I can whistle. Well, yeah. I can whistle. Well, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. I, I, I do, don't, I do don't, like just, just don't, just don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll, go, it'll go straight through you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I do love music and I always listen to music when I'm doing my astronomy and things like yeah. that. Um, so, oh, I just said it. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah the, <laughs> yes, uh, that, that's a bit of an in-joke, listeners. It's, um, we, yeah, exactly, we won't bore yeah. you with the details. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I, I do like to listen to music while mm. I'm doing uh, or in research and things like that. So, But mm. unfortunately, I never learned to play an instrument. Oh, and if I, I mean, I don't have regrets. I never regret anything. But possibly if there was to be one is I didn't learn to, uh, you know, I don't know, play the, play the harmonica or something like that. So... Mm. Uh, Mm. Yeah, it's just one of those things. I never got round to it. Um, I'm not, I was probably not tuneful enough anyway, so I haven't got yeah. rhythm. So, yeah, um, but this is quite yeah, interesting, yeah. though, isn't it? Because mm. um, I mean, I I started learning the piano when I was about seven, and the fact that I had a gnarled old piano teacher called Mrs. Clark who used to thump my hands with her fist when I got things wrong on the keyboard didn't put me <laughs> off. And um, I was far more interested, even at the age of seven, in writing my own music rather than doing the pieces I was meant to be practicing. So I always had this sort of mm -hmm. conflict with successive piano teachers because um, to me, playing other people's music never held any, any, any interest for me. I, I was only interested in writing my own music. And I still do write quite a lot of music. And, uh, you know, I moved on to guitar. And uh, so I do keyboards, guitars and things. But... Uh, you know, if any of our listeners are astronomers and also, you know, creators of music, let us know. Email me at andy at astroradio.earth. It'd be kind of interesting to see how many there are. And if you have any ideas about why you think astronomy and music might be so inextricably linked, because astronomy is full of historically people who have been composers like Herschel and his sister Caroline. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, 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 it's a really interesting link. What, what is the link between astronomy and music? But even if they're not musical, um, they're also very artistic as well. Yeah, and, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. So, yes, it's, but I think it's particularly music like... that seems to go yeah. hand in hand with astronomy. Yeah. If you listen to, to our, our esteemed uh, gaffer, uh, Pete Williamson, Mm. He says that he's always got music in his head when he's doing astronomy, even if he's exactly, not yeah. to it, you know. Yeah. So if you've got any ideas about that, listeners, it'd be really interesting to find out. So as I said, yeah. email me at andy at astroradio.earth and we can get a discussion going about it. Uh, so yeah. there we are. Anyway, getting back to Professor yeah, Mr. Watson. Mr. I'm Watson. sorry, Professor Watson. I, I was describing your achievements and then we got sidetracked. However, um, he was, uh, Professor Watson was actually made a member of the Order of Australia for his services to astronomy and particularly astronomy outreach and uh, the popularization of, of, of space science. Interestingly, he was the project manager for an experiment called the Radial Velocity Experiment or RAVE. Have you ever heard of the, the RAVE experiment? Rave? Yeah. Um, no, I'll, I'll no. say no. I probably have, but I don't know. Well, this was an experiment to measure the radial velocities and metallicities 
of up to a million stars in the Milky Way. Oh, okay, yeah. And it was a big project. And uh, Professor Watson was active in developing instrumentation for this project because he developed robotic uh, wide field fiber optic uh, connections for use in the 1.2 uh, meter UK Schmidt telescope and the 4.2 meter William Herschel telescope. And he did some revolutionary stuff developing uh, fiber optic uh, equipment for that. And you've probably seen how they do it. They, they, they have a big metal plate that is basically uh, full of holes and they plug a fiber, oh, opti yeah. Yeah. Plug a fiber yeah. optic cable into each hole that represents the position of a star. And, um, and then when the starlight falls on them, the light goes down the fiber optics. And uh, so a lot of that pioneering work was done by Professor Watson, which is quite interesting. He's also an ad adjunct professor in the University of South, uh, New South Wales, sorry, not South Wales, New South Wales, Western Sydney University, University of Southern Queensland, the Queensland University of Technology. And he's an, also an honorary fellow at Macquarie University in Australia as well. So he's had quite a, a long and, um, and really interesting and valuable career. So uh, Professor Watson, if you're, if you're listening to this, then uh, we salute you for all that work that you've yeah. done, particularly with the Rave experiment, uh, which gave us a lot of incredible data about stars in the Milky Way galaxies, about how metallic they are. Uh, just for the benefit of the listeners, when we talk about a star being metallic, it means it contains elements uh, heavier than than hydrogen, highly uh, hydrogen, hydrogen, helium, and lithium, he, he, the, he, the light he, elements. Anything heavier than that to astronomers is is known as a metal. So he he and his team measured the metallicity of uh, one million stars in the Milky Way, and he developed a lot of the fiber optic technology. So there you are. So that's uh, mm. Professor Fred Watson. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, because now you say about the the, the 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 sort of like the tables that are just left in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, um, I have seen them. Yes, and they're 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 rusty old things with uh, you know you say with the cables running underneath. Yeah, 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 I have seen that. Yes, yeah, 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 so yeah, uh, yeah. But I mean, oh, well done, you know, Mr. Watson. A, a brilliant bit of design because they work yeah. perfectly. So simple, isn't it? It's it's simple simple design. Well. Just yeah. make make a hole where the star is. And um, and let let the sunlight fall on that hole, and then take the light away in a fiber optic uh, yeah. to, to be amplified and, and and recorded. So yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Oh, there you are, Dad. So that's Professor Fred Watson. Back to you. Right. <clears throat> F is for the Fermi paradox. Well, the Fermi paradox. The Fermi right. paradox. Right. Yeah. right. I'm um, now this follows on from um, Mr. Drake's uh, yes, equation. Indeed. indeed. Um, it's the opposite end basically he's asking how many civilizations are there mm. and mr fermi who was an italian american uh, physicist called enrico fermi wants to know where are they yeah and that's simply it that's what the paradox is mm. where are they if, the if there's all these yeah if the universe is filled with intelligent life yeah. why hasn't it made any attempt to contact us um, and uh, just a brief story of how the, it came about is that uh, back in the uh, 1980s, uh, I think it was, uh, he and a few colleagues were all talking about some recent UFO reports that you get in the USA and you get them quite often over there. And they were just talking about the possibility um, of it and, poss and then talk discussing the possibility of, of life. And I suppose the Drake equation was discussed and things like that. But then they were all sat around the dinner table um, and just having a general chat. And then all of a sudden, Enrico just suddenly just said, well, where are they? Yeah. And they just all suddenly stopped. What are you talking about? And then they all suddenly realized he was talking about where are all the extraterrestrials? Mm -hmm. If they're supposed to be the so many in our own galaxy, why haven't we detected them? Why haven't we seen them? Yeah. Um, and uh, basically, he said there are billions of stars in the Milky Way similar to the sun. We have a high prob probability some of these have Earth-like planets in a circumstellar habitable zone. Mm. Uh, many of these stars and hence their planets are much older than the sun. If the Earth is typical, some may have developed intelligent life long ago. Some of these civilizations may have developed interstellar travel, uh, a, step, uh, a step humans are investigating now. Even at the slow pace of currently 
uh, envisioned interstellar travel, the Milky Way could be completely traversed in a few million years. Right. And since many of the stars uh, are similar to the sun, are billions of years older, Earth should have already been visited by extraterrestrial civilizations, or at least their probes. Mm. Um, however, there is no convincing evidence that this has ever, ever happened. Yeah. Um, there have been many attempts to explain the Fermi paradox, uh, similarly suggesting that intelligent uh, beings are extremely rare, that the lifetime of such civilizations is short, or that they exist, but are, for various re uh, reasons, humans don't see them. Um, right. see the evidence so mm. um, and that's basically what the, the Thermae paradox is all about um, it, it's, he's, he's asking the question is where is everybody um, and apparently it can be asked uh, the Fermi paradox can be asked in two ways the first is why are no aliens or their artifacts found here on earth mm. or in the solar system um, if interstellar travel was, is possible, even the slow kind nearly within the reach of uh, Earth's technology, then it would only take 5 million or 50 million years to colonize the galaxy. Yeah. This is relatively brief in a uh, geological scale, let alone a cosmological one. Since there are many stars, stars older than the sun and since intelligent life might have evolved earlier, uh, colonization uh, earlier, uh, elsewhere the question then becomes why the galaxy has not been colonized already even if a colonization is impractical or undesirable to all alien civilizations large-scale exploration of the galaxy could be possibly it could possibly by probes possibly done by probes mm. uh, this might leave detectable artifacts in the solar system such as old probes uh, or evidence of mining activity, but none of these have been found. The second form of the question is, why do we see no signs of uh, intelligence elsewhere in the universe? Mm. This version does not assume interstellar travel, but includes other galaxies as well. For, dis for, distance, uh, for distant galaxies, travel times may well explain the lack of alien visits to Earth. Yes. But a sufficient advanced uh, civilization could potentially be observable over a significant fraction of the size of the uh, observable universe. Uh, universe. If, even if such civilizations are rare, the scale argument uh, indicates that they... Uh, where was that? The scale in, uh, argument indicates they should exist somewhere at some point during the history of the universe. And since they could be detected from far uh, away over a considerable period of time, many more potential sites for their origin are within range of human observation. It is unknown whether the paradox is stronger for the Milky Way galaxy or for the universe as a whole. So um, it, it does go on and you could mm. it just give you lots of reasons why things, you know, civilizations uh, could destroy themselves or they have used up all their um, uh, supplies and things like that, the things they need to live um, and so have perished. Um, and it also, you know, you talk about, uh, you can talk about technologies as well. But yes, the Fermi paradox is the... Uh, the question that is asked, which was has been raised by basically the Frank Drake equation. So basically, the the Fermat paradox is where, where is everybody? The, yeah, where yeah. is everybody? Yeah. So think, that is um, basically it. I think one. I think we, you know we've talked about this before, mm -hmm. but one of the big problems I have with asking, well, not so much asking the question, but one of the answers to this is why would we ascribe human desires and motivations to an alien species perhaps there are no aliens who are remotely interested in contacting other civilizations why would they be perhaps it's a you know it's a human thing where humans have this innate desire to explore we're naturally curious we want to know what's beyond the next horizon we want to yeah. contact whoever is beyond the next horizon why would we assume that aliens would be the same they may have belief systems that would prohibit them from doing so. And, um, you know, you don't have to look far back in history um, to people like uh, Giordani Bruni and other people who, who were murdered for their belief that there could be alien life out mm. there in the stars. 
you know, but we've we've grown up since then. We we got into the Renaissance and that that cleared out a lot of the rubbish. Um, but why would we think aliens would 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 be any different? There yeah. may be alien civilizations that are not interested in contacting others. Yeah. There may be alien civilizations at these centers of globular clusters where it never gets dark, who don't actually know that there might be other civilizations out there. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, also, I mean, they may not want to be. No, exactly. Discovered. They just want to. Exactly. Um, and, and so also, if some of these uh, technological, um, uh, if they've got technology, technology far advanced to ours, they could actually be um, hiding themselves because yeah. they don't want to be found. Um uh, maybe they may have had a, been visited and had a bad experience. You don't know, or maybe they just don't think we're worth it. No, um, exactly, exactly. And because um, yeah. it, we had all that that kerfuffle about Tabitha Star, where they thought they'd found a Dyson sphere, yeah, yeah, um, a years ago, but now I, they think it was uh, cosmic dust um, that's been called yeah, that, that's, and all that. that still is a result because there's, yeah. there's still not a convincing explanation for for how yeah. that works tabby star however um yeah so in answer to the question where is everybody well you know people miss uh, um misunderstand the the distances involved between the stars and uh when you think that our voyager spacecraft had just left the solar system and they were launched in 1977 and they've only just got to the edge of the solar system uh it's taken that long you know, and it would take thousands upon thousands of years just to get to the nearest star. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, perhaps it will never be possible to shorten those, those travel times. Perhaps it's not possible to fast, uh, travel faster than light or come up with some way of circumventing that restriction. And, um, you know, the alien civilizations just aren't interested. Uh, but we'll, we'll we exactly. won't know. I mean, we, yeah, we we've all, the, we've all our, yeah, with all our searches in, in uh, for uh, extraterrestrial talk, we make a hell of a lot of assumptions yeah, we that do. these people want to be contacted, that they're going to understand us, they're going to understand physics like we do, yeah, yeah, uh, mathematics and things exactly. like that. I mean, exactly. yeah, but there's no guarantee that um, you know they've even got fingers. You know, so well, I think you if you, I mean, uh, as an example of that, and we talked about this before, if you look at the Romans as an example. The Romans were not interested in the physics and maths. They knew how to make things work. They knew how to build their aqueducts and all the wonderful things they did with mm. water. But they didn't really use maths and physics to do it. Um, you know, they just, just, they're just sort of rule of thumb stuff, basically. Exactly, yeah. So why do we assume that, you know, alien civilizations will be different to that? So yeah. interesting. And the only way we're going to know is stuff. when we find it. Yeah, exactly. So, so there we are. So that's um, that's the Fermi paradox. F is for Fermiot. Now I'm going to spell that for you. F obviously, O R N J O T, which, as I can, as far as I can see, it's pronounced Fermiot. It's the third outermost satellite of Saturn. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a moon oh, of Saturn. Okay. A moon. And okay. uh, it was discovered in 2005 by uh, Scott Shepard, uh, David Jewett, uh, Jan Klenyer, and Brian Marsden. And this is an interesting moon. I'll tell you why in a moment. It's about six kilometers in diameter. It orbits Saturn uh, at a, a mean distance of um, 23 million miles, believe it or not. So it's, it's really a long way out from Saturn. And it's got an inclination of 168 degrees to the ecliptic. So okay. it's got a pretty high inclination. Yeah. Um, and uh, relative to Saturn's equator, it's 160 degrees. So, you know, oh, this okay. is a <laughs> steep inclination. It's a very so uh, just, just to explain that for our listeners who might not know what that means, if you think of the orbits uh, of the moons of Saturn in a flat plane, like the solar, most of the solar system is relative to the sun, these moons are tilted, if you like. Their orbits are tilted quite highly. Now, uh, the thing about it, uh, we don't really know um, how long it takes to rotate. It's somewhere between seven uh, and ten hours. It's uh, such a tiny moon that we, 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 you know, no spacecraft has ever been near it. So it's uh, just a, a dim point of, tiny point of light in even the biggest telescopes. Uh, Fernyot was named after Fernyot, a giant in Norse mythology, 
And this brings us on the next point I wanted to make. It's a member of the Norse group of oh, satellites. Oh, yeah, I've heard of those, yeah. Yeah, and this is a group of moons that orbit Saturn uh, in a retrograde motion, so in other words, backwards compared to the rest of the moons. And they all have these uh, large eccentricities in their, in their orbits. And um, they range between 12 million miles from Saturn and 24 million miles from Saturn. So, they, you know, these are a long way out. And they are divided into subgroups as well. There's the SCATHI subgroup, S-K-A-T-H-I, uh, whose uh, distance uh, ranges from 15 and 20 million miles. Inclinations between 147 and 158 degrees. And uh, if you think of... Uh, a planet like Saturn and Jupiter that got 60, 70, 80 moons, I don't mm. know how many we're up to now. They are, each one is divided into, into groups. They're not a single population of moons. They have populations that do different things to the other moons. And the Norse group is, uh, is one of them. And uh, in October 2019, Scott Shepard again, using the Subaru telescope at uh, Mauna Kea, discovered 20 new moons in this group of Norse, uh, uh, Norse moons. Uh, so, um, well, he discovered 20 new moons, 17 of them actually thought to fit into the, the Norse group. And while we're on the subject of F, there's another one of the Norse group called Farbauti, F-A-R-B-A-U-T-I. And that was another one discovered by uh, Shepard, uh, Jewett, uh, Jan Klenya and Brian Marsden, again in 2005. And that's another Norse moon of, of Saturn. And that's slightly smaller at about five kilometers in, in diameter. And named after Fabauti, and I apologize to our, our Scandinavian listeners for what is almost certainly my terrible pronunciation. Um, and again, uh, Fabauti was a storm giant from Norse mythology who just happened to be the father of Loki. So, oh, father of Loki, okay. Yeah, then. yeah, so now you know who the father of Loki was, Farbauti. So, yeah. so there we are. So anyway, that's, that's, um, that's a little bit about uh, Fornyot and Farbauti, the, the members of this Norse group of satellites orbiting Saturn, long distance from Saturn with high eccentricity. So there yeah, you are. When, when you get out to these big gas giants, they've got so many different uh, well, that's satellites, right. as I say. Because, uh, I mean, all right, we call them moons and all that, but I prefer to refer to them as satellites, the smaller ones. Yes. Um, and some of them are definitely um, captured asteroids. And, oh, a lot uh, of them are. Without, um, without things that. like that. So, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I had heard of the Norse group. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, oh, yeah, it's good. Yeah, because well, they've all got Norse names as well, as you said. And, yeah. Uh, some Absolutely. of them are hard to pronounce, as you said. And, and in right. fact, it was a stipulation of the International Astronomical Union that uh, any new discoveries in that group had to have Norse names. Yeah, because I mean, they even with the planets themselves, the bigger moons are all named after yes. a category. That's right. Um, uh, so they, you can't just sort of like pick a name willy nilly. Um, it's just got to be uh, along a certain. Uh, usually Greek mythology or Roman mythology, or there's even some Shakespeare stuff going on out there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, very good. Very nice. I like and, that. And we should just uh, tell our listeners, that in case you don't know, the International Astronomical Union is an international group who are responsible for the official naming of things in the universe. Like exactly. You, you can't yeah. just name it how you like. Um, it has to go along with, with the guidelines of the uh, International Astronomical Union. And they always make exactly the right decisions, as Pete Williamson will tell you. So, uh, so, so, so that's, that's off the air now. <laughs> Pete knows it's true. It's yeah, all bluster, yeah. really. <laughs> okay, then, Dad, so that's, uh, that's Fawn Yacht and the uh, the Norse moons of Saturn. Back to you. Excellent. Yes, lovely. Um, right, F is for, and now you, you have pronunciation problems, um, Fomalt. Fomalt? F-O-M-A-L-H-A-U-T. Uh, yes. Um, uh, it's in uh, Alpha Piskis, Austri Austrini. Yes. Um, so it's a southern constellation as such, but I think it just peaks above the thing is the brightest star in the constellation of as, as i said piskis Austra australianus mm. uh the seven fish uh one of the brightest stars in the sky 
It is a class A star on the main sequence, approximately 25 light years uh, from the sun, mm -hmm. as measured by the Hipparchus uh, astronomy satellite. Oh, yes. Uh, ast astrometry. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, astrometry, yeah. Yes. That's right. Since 1943, the spectrum of this star has served as one of, uh, of the stable anchor points by which other stars are classified. It is classified as a Vega-like star that emits excess, um, excess infrared radiation, indicating it is surrounded by a circumstellar disk. Now you're asking yourself, what's a circumstellar disk? Well, I'll come back to that in a minute. Right. Uh, Vom Holt was the first stellar system with an extrasolar, extrasolar planet candidate designated Vom Holt B, so very imaginative, um, but later nicknamed Dajon. Mm. Uh, that's D-A-G-O-N. Um, imaged uh, in uh, visible wavelengths, um, analysis of uh, of existing and new data suggests that Fulmont B is not a planet, rather an expanding it's a dust cloud, isn't it? After dust cloud, yeah, from uh, from a former uh, collision. Yeah. Um, I'll just explain, have a quick run through what a, a, a circumstellar disk is. It's a it's a debris disk, basically. Um, and it's a disk like we had around uh, the Earth in the early years, from which you will get possibly get planets um, form. Um, but they also contain rings, um, and they, they have been seen around Formalt. Uh, debris disks have been found around both mature and young stars, as well as at least one debris disk in orbit around an evolved neutron star. Oh, there we go. Oh, I see. Um, young de debris disks can constitute a phase in the formation of a planetary system following the protoplanetary disk phase. So that's when you're talking about um, making of disks and things like yes. that. When terrestrial planets may finish, may finish growing. Uh, they can be produced and maintained as remnants of collisions between planetesimals, otherwise known as asteroids asteroids and comets so that's what that is now the reason and it was a strucky um, a lucky strike this if you remember go thinking all the way back to the very first show in and we did a mm -hmm. you chose al i did as in the names uh for uh, arab names for stars yes. and i started to tell you a tale about um the uh, in persian um astronomy uh, mm. and from that is that uh, that they had four stars which had a special name and properties and formot is actually one of them as it turns right. out and they are known as the royal stars the royal stars interesting they're royal stars why yeah. um so it says some old uh, persian names in astronomy have already have barely survived uh, the names of the four royal stars that were used by the Persians for almanacs like Aldebaran, Regulus, At Antares and Formalt and are thought by scientists to equate to their modern day star systems of Alcyon, uh, Regulus, Alberio and Bungula, Alpha Centauri for almanacs. Um, right. So the, yes, they had these four stars and they, they are associated really with the equinoxes. Ah, I see. Um, and I've just got a little bit more information. Hence here. the term um, royal stars, presumably having some significance. Yeah, and uh, basically I'll just give you a quick read through this. Um, yeah, in, sure. Now, oh, right, well, I'm going to use a nasty word now. I'll, I'll wash my mouth out with a uh, thing that says the royal stars. In astrology, <coughs> oh, God, I'm choking. The royal stars in Persia. Wash your mouth out. Yes, exactly. <laughs> are Alberon, Regulus, Antares, and Formot. Right. They were regarded as the guardians of the sky in approximately 3000 BC, during the time of the ancient Persians in the area of modern day Iran. The Persians believed that the sky was divided into four districts, with each district being guarded by one of the royal stars. The stars were believed to hold both good and evil power, and the Persians looked upon them for guidance in scientific calculations of the sky, such as the calendar and lunar solar cycles for predictions. Nice. Uh, the royal stars are mentioned in the Bundahusen, um, that's B-U-N-D-A-H-I-S-H-N, a uh, collection of Zor Zoroastrian. We mentioned that before. Uh, the Zoroastrians, yes. 
two thousand and one, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. Um, cos cosmogony uh, and cosmology. Uh, the four stars with their modern names, and I'll also give you their Persian names, um, are Alberon, which is Tashester, uh, which is the vernal equinox, watcher of the east. Right. Regulus, which is Venant, mm-hmm. uh, summer solstice, watcher of the north. And Teres, Satavis, autonomal equinox, watcher of the west. And Fomalt, which is Hastrangang, Hastorang, uh, which is the winter solstice, which is the watcher of the south. Um, they're basically, yeah, their magnitudes are one point five or brighter, um, and they're part of the in the constellations with the twenty five brightest stars in the sky. So um, it's, um, but that's that's what they were, and I, I thought I, I couldn't remember what they actually were, and they're, they're actually called the four royal stars, and they're associated with their uh, equinoxes. And um, there is a, a load more information if you want to go online and see about them. But sometimes going back into ancient astronomy uh, and what the ancient civilizations saw and what they believed and all that can be very very interesting and, it, it uh, is very interesting you, and i must admit of... i'd never heard of the uh, the four watchers of the skies uh yeah. before that's that's really interesting I'll, I'll, now now i've got that genesis song going around my, around my, my head <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um so yeah, yeah it is very interesting that's that's all very interesting does and yeah, uh, yeah. It, it is fascinating how different cultures and different belief systems have have uh, come up with different ideas about the yeah because the, the the pre-islamic um in pre-islamic history um uh the the equinoxes uh and the solstices are big occasions for them they there's yes, big celebrations and um things like uh and and that sort of thing right so uh, yeah, yeah. um i just thought you'd like to know that and i thought i'd just sort of like add on there as i said there is more on the internet if you'd like to read about them right. um and what they actually meant for um uh these people yeah so um yeah that, that's uh full malt. uh f is for full malt. fantastic thank you so much for that so interesting the F is for the Foster Observatory. Oh, okay. Now, basically, we know today that we have the European Southern Observatory in Chile. Uh, we have ALMA, the, the uh, millimeter submillimeter array in, in Chile. We have um, a lot of really big telescopes in Chile, radio telescopes and optical telescopes, because the skies in Chile are clear they're dry they're still uh, they are probably the best skies for observing on the planet so this is why a lot of countries have built observatories there the chilean government it has to be said are really forward-looking in this and embrace the science of astronomy because they know that the benefit of the benefits that it can bring to their country but really they have always been very forward-looking and embracing the the science of studying the universe But of course, it all had to start somewhere. And it started with an astronomer called uh, William Wallace Campbell at the Lick Observatory in the US. Now, what he was doing, and we're talking about um, the 1890s here, he was doing uh, radial velocity measurements of stars in the northern, the the skies of the, the northern hemisphere. And he thought it'd be really valuable to do the same sort of work in the southern hemisphere. So he started looking around for somewhere where they might build an observatory in um, in the southern hemisphere and, of course, found Chile with its incredible skies. But he couldn't do anything about it because um, he didn't really have the authority. The um, uh, the 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 director of the Lick Observatory at the time, uh, James Edward Keeler, died in 1900 and Campbell became head of the Lick Observatory. And this enabled him to carry out his, 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 his dream of building a southern observatory to do radial velocities of stars, which is, is effectively, you know, where stars are moving to and how yeah. fast they're, they're moving. And um, he managed to get together with a guy called D.O. Mills, who was a banker, and, and he gave uh, $26,000 initially to Campbell to get this scheme off the ground. And they built in um, on a ridge overlooking uh, Valparaiso in, in Chile. 
It's uh, the ridge is called the summit of uh, Theral San Cristobal, and they built an observatory um, in um, just about three years with the same facilities as the Lick telescope. So it became a southern equivalent of the Lick telescope. Interestingly, it only cost them in Chile an 18th of the cost that the Lick Observatory had cost <laughs> built, uh, not surprisingly. And um, it was, uh, you know, the, the aim was to develop a catalogue of radial velocities of stars of the Southern Hemisphere. And during its first year of operations, it was one of the largest nine telescopes uh, in the world. And uh, it's got a, a primary mirror of 93 centimeters, uh, of course, tiny compared to today's uh, standards, uh, today's monster telescope. You look at the monsters that are in Chile now. Yeah. Um, you know, 93 centimeters was, was not big, but it was one of the world's biggest, largest telescopes, the top nine. And it's still sort of open. It's been used for research. Um, it, it closed for many years, but reopened in 1982 and uh, then shut down again in 1995. It's always funding that is the, is the problem. But now, uh, in 2010, it was declared a national monument in Chile, national historical monument, which means that it can't be permanently closed and demolished. Mm. It's preserved. And astronomy in Chile really started with Campbell and, um, and his plan to build a southern equivalent of the Lick Observatory to measure the radio yeah, velocity of stars. And it's all gone yeah. from there in Chile, basically. Fantastic. So there you are. So that's the Foster yeah. Observatory. Now, I should tell you who it's named after. Um, initially, it was named after the bank who put up the money. The, it was called the D.O. Mills Observatory. Uh, but um, the, in 1928, the uh, Catholic University of Chile received it as a donation from politician and professor uh, Man Manuel Foster Recabaran, Re 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 if I pronounce that uh, correctly. Yeah, yeah. And so um, he donated it, he bought it and donated it um, to the university. Um, and that's how, that's how it survived. And he was Manuel F Foster. So I should imagine he had a European parent somewhere along the way, European yeah. family. Um, and uh, it became known as the Foster Observatory. So there you go, Daz. Oh, there you go. Didn't know that. There you go. Um, I've just got one very quick one to um, finish with. Okay. And it's F is for fighting dragons of Ara and what? egg. <laughs> and egg, yes. Do you know what peridolia is? Yes, it's the uncanny ability that humans have to see faces in places where there aren't faces for example the face on mars yeah you've spot on there yeah um it's basically when people look at clouds they see shapes yes. uh, and things like that and it's, it's just um and uh, it, that that's what it's all about so of course when we look up into the skies we see these nebula and one of the most spectacular one along with sort of like the tarantula nebula mm -hmm. is the fighting dragons of ara and egg um, right. These are objects NGC 6188 and NGC 6164. Now, when you see them, uh, and they've, they've all been processed and all that, you can't miss the fighting dragons. There's two dragons, and they're literally going hammer and tongs at each other. And it is a most beautiful nebula. I don't use that word very often, but they are, you, you can't miss them. You, 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 they are, they're there to be seen. So where, um, where are they exactly? Which uh, there is a seven hemisphere. Um, uh, they would be, wouldn't they? Yeah, of course. Yeah, we won't be able to see them. Uh, um, so, uh, I think it did. It, they are in the constellation Ara. Um, ah, which they're is Ara, the right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but also, just below them, uh, the, the fighting dragons, and you can see them, they've got claws going, they've got their beaks wow. going. They're <laughs> really having a go yeah. at each other. There is a lovely little blue... Uh, oval spot uh, which again is another nebula and that is what they call the egg the egg right. egg so i have to look up images of those definitely exactly you go online and look at the fighting dragons of ara uh, and egg and as and soon egg. as you see them you cannot miss the dragons uh, they stand out so prominently and they're like i said they're really having a go at each other you know somebody spilt somebody's beer you can see it <laughs> um so yeah and underneath you'll see the little uh blue nebula which they refer to as the egg so that right. is f 
for the fighting dragons of Ara. Just a quick one to finish with. Well, wow, that's great. Thank you. I shall definitely, uh, after the program, I shall definitely have a look at those. Yeah, definitely have a look, mate, because it's one of the most uh, fantastic um, nebulas we can see. Oh, and thank you very much. To see, when you see them, they are, you, you can't miss them. You can't miss them. Fantastic. So, yeah, there thank you, go. you so much. Well, Des, I guess that brings us to the end of another week of the amazing. Yeah, it goes program. so fast, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? Um, really interesting this week, again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we didn't have any duplicates. We didn't have any duplicates. What's going which is on? Amazing, which is amazing. Yeah. How cool are we, eh? So, <laughs> so there we are. Hope you've enjoyed it, listeners. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah. If you would like to email us at any time, you can email me, andy at astroradio.org. And if you do have any thoughts about the links between astronomy and music, uh, let me know, because I, I, can't, I can't find it fascinating. So if you have any thoughts on that uh, that you'd like to share, email me at andy at astroradio.earth. We'll be back next week, of course, with um, and, uh, the ABCDEFG. <laughs> we're, on, we're on G next week. And, Do you know uh, what? Even I could think of yeah, yeah, that. My mind went blank for a moment. So, um, <laughs> so I'll, be, I'll be talking to somebody about the Cyrillic alphabet, the Russian alphabet, all, all, yeah. uh, oh, no, we're not going down all, all afternoon, which, which, I, which I studied. Um, yeah. So, um, so, yeah, we'll be back with G next week. And yeah. uh, we, we hope you have a fantastic week and uh, take care of yourself. Stay safe. And uh, we will look forward to, to talking to you again next week. Yeah. So stay safe, everybody. Stay safe, everybody. And thanks so much for listening. We do appreciate it. And uh, take care of yourselves. And it's goodbye from the amazing astronomical alphabet. Bye. <laughs>